for our final discussion of this day-long series of discussions, I'd like to bring to the stage Claudine Brown, the Assistant Secretary for Education and Access of the Smithsonian Institution, who will introduce the final panel. Claudine? Um, I am Claudine Brown, and I'd like to say thank you to KIPP, hard act to follow. Um, I saw the show at the Japanese American National Museum, and it was incredibly powerful. So this particular panel, um, which is the last of the day, addresses museums and the multidimensional American story. Um, I am familiar with the origins of all four of the museums represented today um, and believe that they begin to help us to understand the fight for having our stories told and having our messages be heard. Um, I will introduce you to those individuals who are participating on the panel. To my far right is Lawrence Pigeot, and he is the president and CEO of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, to my immediate left is Beth Takakawa. She is the executive director of the Wing Luke Museum of the Asian Pacific American Experience, which is in Seattle, Washington. Um, to her left is Helen Samhan, who is the senior outreach advisor for the American American National Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. And I hope joining us shortly will be Carlos Tortolero, president of the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago, Illinois. I've asked each of them to take about 10 minutes to tell you a little bit about their museums. And after that, here's Carlos. Let me give him a chance to join us. Thank you. So each of them will tell you a little bit about their museums. Um, and then we will have a discussion here, and we will open that discussion to the audience. So I am going to ask Lawrence to start. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> it's a good afternoon. We're all here. I have truly enjoyed uh, today's program, and I want to uh, thank Claudine Brown for extending an invitation for me to participate in this program. Uh, and I also thank everyone who played some role in dealing with the logistics that uh, brought me here from Birmingham, Alabama. I'm also happy that I have been here all day. Uh, learned a lot. Uh, we'll go back home with uh, quite a bit of information. I'll share with you some things that really caught my attention during uh, the program today. Listening to Joseph Henry's comments about race, uh, said something about the history of the Smithsonian and uh, how his comments may have played out and how this institution has evolved. Uh, I also enjoyed Dr. Price, who talked about forgetfulness and amnesia. Uh, in my part of the world, we talk about selective amnesia, Dr. Price. And he also mentioned living in the shadows, and he rattled off a couple of shadows, including uh, slavery, the slave trade. I, I'd like to add to that list uh, segregation. We like to forget about that. And Dr. Thomas uh, talked about uh, the fact that others tend to tell the history of ethnic groups and cultures that they might not have a whole lot of information about. And as I listen to uh, the presenters today, the, the underlying theme for me uh, was inclusion. And uh, I'm reminded that the more things change, uh, the more they remain the same, because some of these conversations I've been involved in for uh, the 17 years that I've been at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. But with that said, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, the Institute, I'll tell you. Uh, about its beginning, which was a pretty tough uh, time in the city of Birmingham. Uh, a little about our exhibition and some of the things that uh, we feel pretty good about, some of our accomplishments, and I'll conclude with some of the challenges that I see. Uh, our mission, which uh, drives us every day, is to promote civil and human rights worldwide through education.
in the mid-1970s, uh, former mayor David Van, David Van was the last white mayor we've had in, in Birmingham. Uh, David took a trip to Israel and paid a visit to several of the museums there and returned to Birmingham in the mid-70s uh, talking about uh, the city chronicling its civil rights history. Uh, uh, that uh, went to deaf ears. Uh, no one in the city was interested in uh, bringing uh, that history to light. However, uh, Dr. Richard Arrington Jr. in 1979 uh, picked up the baton. Uh, he too had some challenges uh, with that project and uh, actually sold a building in Birmingham, Alabama to find the seed money to put the building, put up the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. And behind me, you're looking at uh, the facility before it was completed. And what Dr. Arrington did was uh, create uh, a study group. And that study group evolved into uh, a task force that was formed in uh, 1986. And ultimately, uh, our facility opened in 1992. So you can see that uh, this whole notion of a Birmingham Civil Rights Institute uh, it took about 15 to 16 years to really move from uh, idea to, to uh, a facility. And uh, when it opened, it cost approximately $14 million. We think by now it would be three to four times that amount. And one of the problems that both uh, Mayor Van and, and Dr. Arrington ran into is that people did not want to talk about the history of the movement. Uh, they, they were afraid that this institution would open old wounds, and uh, they, uh, we didn't have a track record. We were new in the arena at the time. The only other civil rights museum that preceded us by one year was the National Civil Rights Museum uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. So there was a big concern about what we might do. Our exhibitions, uh, they include videos, uh, original artifacts, replicas of artifacts, newspaper clippings, and we have an extensive oral history project. We've interviewed over 600 individuals who were actively involved in, in the movement. And one of the things that many people come to see is the original jail cell door that uh, behind that door, Dr. Martin Luther King wrote a very famous letter from Birmingham jail. And it's become, uh, in many ways, a, a wishing well. Uh, people uh, throw coins behind the door and uh, make say prayers and, and, and say things that uh, are designed to promote uh, world peace and they are hoping that they can return to their respective communities and make things better. Some of the things that we feel pretty good about and 2005, we were accredited by the American Association of Museums. Uh, at, at the time, we were the only African-American uh, history museum accredited by uh, AAM. And in 2007, we became a, an affiliate of uh, the Smithsonian Institution, and we, we were pretty, pretty proud of that. We've received two national awards, uh, both at the White House, one in 2006, the other in 2007. And uh, I think if you forget about the politics of it all, it's really great to find yourself at the White House receiving an award for some work that you've, you've been involved in. And both of the uh, awards were related to our work with young people. One, the first was called the Coming Up Tall Award, uh, which was specifically designed for our work with uh, a group of inner city middle school students. And the other, uh, the National Medal, uh, that was uh, presented to us because of our work in the community at large. And both awards were presented by former First Lady Laura Bush. 
in 2009, uh, we were recognized as the state attraction of the year. Now, let me put that in perspective, okay? We are in Birmingham, Alabama, and we promote civil and human rights, and you know what the state is going through right now with immigration and uh, a lot of things related to the legislation that we have in the state regarding uh, immigration, and we were recognized by the state uh, for our work. In 2009, I had the pleasure of being nominated by the 44th President Barack Obama to serve on the Institute of Museum and Library Services Board, and I was confirmed by the Senate in 20. 10. Now, uh, on a personal note, uh, there's no way while growing up in New Orleans, Louisiana, in the segregated South, needing special permission to visit libraries and museums, could I ever imagine that we'd have an African-American president, let alone one who's nominated me to serve on the board, that uh, has some oversight for institutions that uh, while growing up I had a tough time visiting. So it's a big thing not only for me personally but for the Institute and it also speaks to the progress that we have made in the country and hopefully the progress that we'll continue to make. In 2010, we received a grant from the Museums and Community Collaborations a broad program which amounted to us collaborating with the Apartheid Museum in South Africa and the Mandela House in South Africa. And behind me, uh, you're looking at a slide related to the uh, expansion of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute where we have uh, created a gallery that shows the relationship between civil and human rights initiatives worldwide. But I'm going to move to the next slide, which uh, is of s some South African youngsters who we collaborated with uh, a few months ago. And, and the gist of this project was an exchange program. We had 10 youngsters from inner city Birmingham who, through Skype, were able to connect with 10 high school kids uh, who were affiliated with either the Apartheid Museum or the Mandela House, and these, these youngsters over time became friends, and they shared experiences, uh, their high school experiences, and uh, the youngsters from Birmingham paid a visit to uh, Johannesburg, spent 10 days there, learned about what was going on uh, in South Africa, became very familiar with the Apartheid mu movement, and what the youngsters from Johannesburg spent 10 days in Birmingham. This was one of the most impressive experiences that we've had with high school students. Uh, and the culminating activity was the first Mandela Day in the state of Alabama. And this is the direction that our institution is moving toward. Uh, we are really focusing in on the relationship between the civil rights movement and the influence it has had on, and continues to have on civil rights movements worldwide. Now some of the challenges that I see, the, the effort to maintain our relevance. How do we continue to be relevant? Uh, one of the things we have right now at the Institute is an exhibition titled Living in Limbo. It's an exhibition on the lesbian community in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, that was really a reach for us. We, we labored on whether or not we would install this exhibition. And uh, pleasantly, we've been surprised with the positive feedback we've received, not only from our community at large, but from the community around the world. Sustainability. Funding is a real issue, not only for us, but uh, the museum field in general. Uh, so that's an, uh, an important piece of our future. How do we sustain this place? And last but not least, succession planning. Uh, 
who follows us, those that uh, have been around a while, who replaces the group of leaders at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Uh, and with that, I will tell you that one of the concerns I've had since I've been in this field about 20 years is we do not have enough young people in the pipeline to replace those institute, to replace those individuals who are leading these museums. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us who work at museums to do what we can to increase the pipeline for young people who see this field as a career path. Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me here. I've enjoyed my stay and I look forward to the uh, question and answer period. Thank you. I'm gonna ask Helen to be our next speaker. Thank you very much, Claudine. It's really a pleasure to be here. And um, because we are an Arab American museum, we are a little bit the new kids on the block. We're, um, I, I wanted to just spend a, a little bit of time just explaining who, who we are as an ethnic community um, and who we represent as a museum. Um, we represent many generations, many immigrant generations of people from Arabic-speaking countries who, have, who became, began coming in the 1880s until the present. We represent over 22 current nations of origin that span two continents in Africa and in Asia, people of many different religious affiliations, and it's a relatively new ethnic identity. It's a very American ethnic identity like Asian Pacific Islander and Latino. It, it, it's not something that it has been around as long as our immigrant population has been around. But our organizations have have uh, promoted an Arab, Arab American identity in the best American traditions um, for the last 40 years. Um, we represent a population that has very different experiences and very different views on their racial identity. Um, we talked, uh, Dr. Price talked about the journey towards whiteness. Well, we have a very kind of complex experience with race in the United States. The very first pioneers who came in the, at the turn of the century had to fight for their white status because of the Asian exclusion laws that were in place at the time. And because they came on Turkish passports, many judges con uh, considered them Asian from, because Turkey is in Asia, and therefore they were not allowed to have citizenship. So they fought very hard to prove that they were Semites, they were Caucasian, and that they deserved to be treated as, as citizens. And they fought that for many decades. Um, and we have really come really full circle in, in our racial consciousness as a community. There are many in our population who still are very comfortably situated in the white, um, white middle class. Um, but there, are, there was also a new, uh, several new waves of immigration after the 65 um, reforms. And they, these are people who came with a very different uh, approach. They came to a different country. Um, in, in our United States, we, we dealt with immigrants and with uh, cultural and religious difference um, in a very different way, thanks to the civil rights movement. Um, and so there was a pro proliferation of cultural awareness and of religious and, and ethnic um, uh, assertiveness. And so we have many generations now, they're into their second generation, of people who feel that they are very much part of the people of color. And so, our, our white status, our white affiliation, and our racial ambiguity, ambiguity is very much a part of the people that we represent. In some ways, we have gone from invisibility. Um, when my grandparents came in the 1890s, um, it was all about the Ameri becoming American. It was the whole, that theory of the melting pot was very much in, in, in vogue. Um, to the current uh, phase of, of definite of ethnic pride and um, wanting to integrate, but also be recognized for the, the heritage and the, and the contributions that we bring as ethnic Americans. Um, some might ask, and our, our museum is in Dearborn, Michigan. It's not exactly um, a, a, a tourist destination. Um, so you might ask, why did we build it there? Um, we built it in Dearborn, Michigan, which is a suburb of Detroit, because of an amazing institution that um, provided the leadership for the museum, and that's um, the Arab Community Center for Economic and Social Services. And ACCESS has been serving 
immigrant populations in greater Detroit for over 40 years, and they had a very active cultural arts program, and it got so, in, uh, so much in demand that they realized that maybe it's time for us to think about a cultural center. So the conception for the museum happened around the two, year 2000. Um, and they began to uh, think of how we wanted to frame this. Is this an Arab world museum or is it an Arab American museum? And it was definitely decided on the, on the side of being an American museum about the experiences of our community here. Um, we raised over $16 million privately to, uh, to build this beautiful, um, this beautiful building that you see here, which is in downtown De Dearborn across from City Hall. Um, and it was officially opened in the, in the year 2005. Um, what we decided to do in terms of the thematics is that um, we wanted to tell various, uh, various parts of our experience in three major themes. One is the story about coming to America, whether, they came, whether the people who came in the 1880s or post-2000 um, uh, post refugees. It was also um, living, the story is living, of living in America. What is it like to be an American of Arab heritage living in the United States? And the, most, and the third permanent um, exhibit in our museum is called Making an Impact. And that is the one that probably is the most, um, has the most aha moments for people when they come to our museum for the first time because it really showcases um, prominent Americans in all different fields who happen to be of Arab descent. And so it's kind of our wall of fame. Um, and uh, it's also, we felt that it's really important and we've talked a lot about telling stories and, and being part of the narrative. And it was especially important in our community because of this paradox of being invisible for many generations and then all of a sudden being thrust into the political spotlight and to be and to, in, in a sense, be a very politicized uh, culture without necessarily having a way to define ourselves in, in, in one place. Um, many times it was our political detractors who were defining us, or it was people who were, uh, who were trying to paint us as other because of relationships with people in the Arab world. So it was really important that we decided to tell our own story. One of the things about the museum I think that is the most important, see if, this is just a little bit about some of the exhibits in the, um, in the permanent exhibit. I think the most important feature of our museum are the things that happen away from the exhibits and also the things that happen outside the building and in other states. We have a, a, a very strong commitment to national programming. Our educational outreach is perhaps um, uh, the most important in-building program where, we, where fully half of the visitors who come are school children. And this is an extremely important part of you know, changing minds and opening hearts about prejudices that people might bear about who are Arabs, who are Muslims, um, and we also foster, we also are a forum. We talked about whether a museum is a temple or a forum, and in many ways, we are a forum by hosting various segments of the Arab American community, whether they be artists or writers. We have a program for artists called Diwan, which is an annual uh, conference that we do outside of Michigan for Arab American performance artists, fine artists, etc. We have a book award for Arab American writers where we honor uh, Arab American authors um, every year. Um, we also host conferences for Arab American scholars, and this is extremely important because Arab American scholarship is a, is a new field. It, there is no formal um, so, as, association of Arab American scholars. Most people who study the Arab American community have to go to the conference of MESA, for example, the Middle East Studies Association, to be able to discuss issues of Arab American scholarship and research, even though it really belongs in American studies. But there, there is no separate association yet. But the museum is providing a forum for that. And also, it has a, a, a state-of-the-art research library and archive. And I think the archival uh, component of our museum is extremely important because it provides one place, it's the largest repository for research um, and writings about the Arab American experience. Um, I think there's a picture here. 
Um, uh, I thought there was a picture of the library, but the, the research library and the archive is extremely important. It, it is a place where we collect oral history, where we collect dissertations, personal artifacts, family trees, anything that is, uh, is available around the country, we, um, we offer to archive it in, 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 our, in, our, um, in our library. Um, the other thing I think that's very important um, in our experience as a young museum with, with a ver relatively small population is our collaboration. We, we very much have, have depended upon other ethnic and culturally specific museums and, um, for, uh, to help us with our concepts, with, our, with, with the building of the museum. The Japanese American Museum in particular has been our mentor, um, and we're very, very grateful for our for our collaboration with them. And um, in fact, we have a traveling exhibit that is going to be. Um, uh, but one of the ways that we get the mu museum out to the field, and I'm the I'm the outreach advisor, so my job is to take the museum outside of Michigan. And one of the great uh, opportunities we have right now is a is a traveling exhibit that is going to eight cities, and one of them is L.A. and it will go to the Japanese American Museum. And it's a it basically is a, is a an ex exhibition about the century of national service. Um, on the part of Arab Americans. It's basically military service, Peace Corps service, and diplomatic service. Um, and it is, it is intended to kind of undo some of the stereotypes that, about uh, loyalty among Arab Americans, especially after 9-11. And we are very, very excited that this traveling exhibit is going to really take our message out to the field. Um, I, I think I want to close by saying that we also recognize that there are, and we've talked about this in, in this conversation, we do recognize that there are problematics about ethnic specific museums. Um, in some ways that there is always that fear and worry about ghettoizing, whether it's ghettoizing ourselves as Arab Americans or ghettoizing ourselves away from the general American public, even though we do a lot of effort to have outreach. Um, and also there's, there's, sometimes there's a danger of letting the larger society feel kind of off the hook. Oh, well, there's an Arab American museum. You know, we don't have to worry about incorporating their story into, into other institutions. And so that, that, that's always a problematic. And then the third problematic is an internal one in my own, popu in my own community, and that is that it's a very complex um, population. And there are, t there are many people who are from Arabic speaking countries who don't even consider themselves Arab. So sometimes I find myself convincing people whose family came from Lebanon or Syria four generations ago that they, they really will see themselves in this exhibit if they would only come and get past that concern about, well, we're not Arab, you know, we're Lebanese, we're Phoenician, we, we, don't, we don't deal with that Arab stuff. Um, so that, that's, just a, that's just an internal challenge that we have. Um, but I have to say that despite the fears of ghettoizing it, um, I, I, I know as a parent and as an activist, I know that when I see young people come to this museum, especially young Arab Americans who have lived through the last decade of assault on their ethnic and in some cases on their religious um, heritage, it is, it is a place of, of uh, refuge and it is a place to honor the, the true story, the story that used to be told in their, in their grandparents' houses, but it's not what they're hearing in popular culture, it's not what they're hearing in the political discourse. And it is a place where they can, they can really feel, proud, feel pr proud, and I know that that can be a cliche, but in, 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 I think in so many of our experiences as ethnic communities that maintaining pride in our children is, is, a, is a very important thing to, um, to foster. And I'll just close by saying that we are very fortunate to the Smithsonian Institution for granting us uh, affiliation status. It has been an enormous boost to our, org to our institution, not only because it gives us a lot of credibility and a lot of legitimacy, uh, we are the only Arab American museum in the country, um, and we are one of only 140 some uh, recognized affiliates. And to us, that is a real badge of honor. Um, but it also helps open doors, even in our own community, when we go to do fundraising. We tell them, you know, we're an affiliate of the Smithsonian. They say, oh, you are? Well, then they pay attention, and it's, it's, it makes a huge difference in being able to leverage our, our, our future. So with that, I just want to thank you very much for inviting me, and I look forward to our conversation.
Thank you. So next we'll hear from Beth. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Claudine. I just wanted to start out with a bit of a sense of place. Uh, the Wing Luke Museum is located in Seattle, and um, it is a city of 600,000 people in a metropolitan area of 4 million. The closest large city to us is Vancouver, BC. And through economics and culture, Seattle is a location that is decidedly Pacific Rim. It's entwined with Asia, Vancouver, BC, Alaska, Hawaii, and California, with in many ways more connections to the rim than to the east coast of the US. In uh, Seattle and our county, uh, Asian Pacific Americans comprise over 18% of the population, uh, the largest population of color in the city. This is the home of the Wing Luke Museum back when it was constructed in 1910, and it was known as the East Gonyuk Building. With no financial backing from a bank, 170 early Chinese immigrants pooled their money to fund the construction of the East and West Gonyuk buildings. These two buildings served as the anchor for the new Chinatown, providing rooms for rent and commercial spaces for early businesses, like the first taxi service for Chinese residents, uh, wholesale food providers, and job assigners to um, work in the Alaska salmon canneries. Seattle's Chinatown International District is a neighborhood on the south end of downtown. It's probably the only area in the continental U.S. where Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Amer African Americans, Vietnamese, Koreans, and Cambodians settled together and built one neighborhood. The Wing Luke Museum has been located in Seattle's Chinatown International District for all of its 45 years. Today, it's a neighborhood of small businesses and rental residences that is culturally rich and economically depressed. It's the lowest income census tract in the city with the highest inventory of vacant buildings. The wing is dedicated to the continued economic improvement of its neighborhood. Since opening our expansion in this historic building in 2008, the wing is recognized as the neighborhood's second biggest economic engine next to the Asian supermarket, Uwajimaya. The Wing has a unique origin for a museum. It's the legacy of a community hero named Wing Luke. Wing was an immigrant from China who grew up above his family's laundry business in Seattle. He joined the US Army, he was awarded the Bronze Star, and then Wing had the audacity to run for city council in the early 1960s. And despite a smear campaign, he made history by being elected in 1962. He was the first Asian American elected to public office in the Pacific Northwest and the first person of color on the council. He didn't play it safe. Uh, he championed the 1963 uh, open housing ordinance and other issues such as Indian fishing rights and preservation of the historic Pike Place market. Tragically, Wing died in a plane crash at the age of 40 and his family and friends started the Wing Luke Museum which was one of Wing's dreams. Uh, 45 years ago it was started as his legacy. The museum's first home was a rented storefront a block away from the historic building you saw in the earlier photo. The first fundraising consisted of chow mein dinners in a local restaurant and an auction of art by local Asian American artists who at that time had neither funds nor public profile. I've seen in our archives the handwritten budgets for that early fundraising and since the food was donated, it seemed to me that 50% of those tiny expenditures was for booze to <laughs> encourage the bidding. Over the years, the museum changed as the community changed, broadening from being Chinese American to an Asian Pacific American museum and changing its presentations from art from Asia to the stories and art of Asian Americans. Over the past 20 years, the Wing has developed a community-directed approach to all of our work, including all exhibitions and projects. Community advisory committees comprising volunteer com uh, participants meet for a year or more. Our staff facilitates their decisions on exhibit themes, storyline, and design. This results in a high level of community ownership and empowerment 
while sometimes it is a more complex experience for the visitor as there are multiple voices rather than a single curator voice. In 2002, the wing had the opportunity to purchase the historic East Gunyuk building. Over the years, it had become largely vacant and was much the same as it was when it was first built. The building had never been sold and was now owned by hundreds of descendants of the first 170 immigrants who built it. But the prospect of honoring an immigrant legacy and bringing a cherished home into its future led to the building's first ch change of ownership in almost a century. It took the Wing Luke Museum 40 years to go one block and to the first home that we owned. There was the matter of a museum with a $1 million budget raising over $23 million to turn the vacant historic building into a community museum with greatly expanded business operations. We took the same community development approach to programming the building as we do to developing our exhibitions. We formed four committee, community advisory committees involving 65 community volunteers from 12 different ethnic groups ranging in age from 20 to 80 and spanning first to fourth generations from immigrant and refugee communities. Each committee had expertise and examined a building use. There were educators and community historians, neighborhood business owners and community activists, exhibitions and civic engagement folks, and events and arts presenting people. There was the matter of raising the money, and we took the same approach. Our board members started the fundraising, each giving the largest philanthropic gift of their lives. Our staff, who is watching this webcast right now on the big screen, back at the wing, uh, our modestly compensated staff did their own campaign, led by line staff members. With three-year payroll deductions, based often on one less, one less latte per week, and with family gifts, they raised $100,000, which was twice their goal. After five years, the $23 million was raised with significant private and public support, um, also a new market tax credit deal, and three-year pledges from over 1,500 community members. We opened our expanded home in 2008 and are now debt-free. The Wing Luke Museum, thank you. The Winglet Museum today includes intact historic spaces to immerse visitors in the lives of early immigrants from Asia. It also includes 13 exhibition galleries with a wide range of topics. Right now our shows include um, one on Asian American food, another on the art of Asian American video game artists, and a new show coming up exploring why young women of Asian descent have the highest suicide rate in their age demographic. We provide guided tours of our historic building as well as guided walking tours that bring people into neighborhood businesses and historic buildings. We welcome the public to interact with our personal stories and art and to explore our historic neighborhood and to share their own stories and legacies along with ours. Thank you for including the wing in this symposium and please come by and visit. Thank you. Our next, but definitely not last, speaker is Carlos Tortolero. Thank you. You know, you know, a very funny thing happened to me as I was coming to the podium. I got a text from my assistant, and she's very calm. I'm very hyper. And the text said, urgent, urgent, urgent. Call the museum. I'm thinking, oh, my God, what's happening? And 25 years as my assistant, she's never sent me a message. I'm thinking, oh, my God, what has happened? So I run out. She says, Carlos, Carlos, the White Sox called. They want you to throw out the first pitch at a game next week. I'm a baseball freak. I'm like, all right, that's great, that's great. Said, so how's the conference going? The conference? Conference! <laughs> so I apologize, okay? <laughs> but I'm throwing out that first pitch. <laughs> So a moment I forgot where I was at. Doesn't happen very often, but anyway. Okay, now back to early. First of all, I want to thank my panel. I mean, these are great institutions, great people. These are the people that are experts in the field. It's great. Also, to have Claudine Brown. I'm so happy that the Smithsonian has a position like hers, and she's in that position because education is very key to our institution. In fact, when uh, Mr. Bunch spoke earlier and Lani was talking about how education is so important to institutions, it is. I began the museum 30 years ago with a group of my friends all of us were teachers. None of us knew what we were doing. So I always speak to, you know, to, uh, to the school groups, you know, especially people who are, who are you know, in our museum classes, and I tell them, man, if I can do it, you can do it, because we didn't know what we were doing. I never thought that I was going to run the museum. I was a long-haired, blue-jean, 
guy. I still get the blue jeans. The hair is having a problem now, so <laughs> talk to God about that later. But anyway, um, you know, but, but it just turned out that, you know, you know, you know that, I, that I enjoyed what I was doing. I was good at it. Next year, I'm running the museum. And, but what's kind of interesting is from the very beginning, people in the art world in Chicago, in the museum field, they were such, you know, skeptical about what we were doing. It was incredible. They all said, there's no way you can do a museum in a working class neighborhood. There's no way, they, there's no way that you can do an art museum in a working class neighborhood. And there's no way that you can be free in a working class neighborhood. Well, okay, the museum's, the museum's been open 25 years. They were wrong, wrong. Wrong. But what's very interesting, if you go to Chicago and ask those people, they would tell you, oh, I knew from the very beginning it was going to happen. <laughs> but you know, I'm like Santa Claus. I keep my list. So <laughs> I know who was naughty and who was nice, okay? They can write their books. I can write my books. But anyway, but you know, you know, the go ahead from the very beginning was to build a world-class museum in a world-class neighborhood. I thought that was key to our community. The fact that there was such a large population, people from my community, and there was no place to see our art, I thought it was absurd, obscene. We had to change that. We are the only Latino museum that is accredited by the American Association of Museums, which means that we can take care of art as well as anybody can. In fact, our collection manager, if God came to see the artwork, God's gonna have to wear gloves, trust me. Mm -hmm. She's that <laughs> thorough, she's scary. And that's what you want in that position. But at the same time, we wanted to make sure our museum was accessible to everybody. Museums are not for everybody. And, you know, we have to change that. The only way you change that, by admitting you have that problem. But we need to make museums accessible for everybody. The high cost of museums freak me out. I just went to New York to see the Diego Rivera show, $25. Not one person from my community was in that place. That isn't right, folks. This is our culture, our history. We should have access to it. It's interesting that the time that there is more people of color than ever before in this country, there's no money. I don't think that's an accident, folks. I really don't. So things have to change. Um, and I mentioned before how schools education is a key to our institution. One third of our staff, one third of our budget goes to education. One third. We have this huge education department. We're in so many schools in Chicago. Um, we do 1,000, uh, let's see, it was 1,000, uh, let's see, 300, uh, let's see, school tours last year. We're at about 80 schools in Chicago in advanced programs. We are everywhere. It's very important for us to be involved in education. The future is always about the young people. But you know, the thing about institutions is that, you know, is that we do a lot of things that mainstream museums will never do, and we are very different. For example, we do a lot of health things in our institution. You know, we had one event, we had uh, about 200 women, about, they were all like 55 and over, not one had ever had a mammogram in their life. And we had a nurse practitioner showing them how to do a breast examination. I, well, obviously it was not in the room, but it wasn't a performance piece, it was health. <laughs> so we do things like that, because we think it's important for us to be part of the community. We do an annual high school queer prom where kids from throughout the Midwest, from all backgrounds, come to the institution. It's the most fun event we do every year. It's amazing. And uh, it's, just, it's such a real nice event. We sign people up to vote at our institution. So we do a lot of things that other museums don't do. In fact, I should tell you, uh, a, you know, an event that happened to me, because you know, you know, I grew up in a tough part of Chicago, so I've been you know, attacked a lot of times, you know, physically. It's not fun. But probably the worst attack I ever got was I was at a museum conference, AM conference, where these four guys standing around and they're whispering to each other, right? And I knew they wanted to say something to me, but nobody had the guts to say it. Then finally said, somebody says, you don't act like a regular museum does. You don't, you don't. And I told him, you know, I know you're trying to insult me, but thank you, I don't want to be like you. Mm. And so our goal has always been, how do we take care of the earth? as well as everybody, but change the mindset of what a museum can be. Why can't museums be accessible? Why can't they be free? Why can't we do a lot of things? Why can't we be a part of the community instead of a part from the community? So it's been very key for us, you know, that, that whole mindset. And I've had a board who has allowed me to do a lot of crazy things, so I'm very grateful to that, because boards can be very interesting places. <laughs> um, the other thing, too, that I think is it's important is that you know, you know, you know, despite of the comments I'm making, I'm not against the large museums. I love all museums, and we're not in a situation, none of us are the panel, we want to create an either or situation. We want all museums to thrive. We want to create an and situation. But there is problems, for example, you know, just the situation about fundraising. You know, I can't tell you how many times I hear a large museum get this huge grant to do something about my culture, and they are clueless, and then they call us up that we have to help them. 
And then if I applied for the same grant, there's no way to work at the same amount of money. So that unfairness is something that really mm -hmm. concerns us a lot. We have done a lot of shows that have traveled, but probably our most famous show, we did a show called uh, The African Presence in uh, Mexico. That's a show that traveled to 11 cities across the United States. It is the only exhibition to ever go to an African American museum, a Latino museum, a mainstream museum, and also travel south of the border. No other museum's ever done that. Also, the word mainstream, we do have to change that term because we are the mainstream in all these cities. So that term needs to change as well, but we have to find a better word for that. But what was very interesting about that show, it was the challenge of, of doing something like that because this was a topic that for a lot of people in my community was very, very hard for them to deal with. It was very uncomfortable for many people to deal with it. But probably the greatest compliment was during the last four months of the show, two-thirds of our audience was African-American. Now, I love Chicago. I'm a big Chicago booster. But you, know, but you know, we travel all over the world, but we don't travel across the city of Chicago. So to be able to accomplish that was really, really a great honor for us. The other thing, thing too, is that you know, you know, you know, our institutions are always are attacked about, is the work we're doing of quality nature? I have never heard that being asked from a large museum. Why is the quality issue always being asked of us? but not of them. So it's always very good that, you know, the second layer, this minor league kind of museum, and it comes from the powers that be. So that's a bit disturbing that it happens. Um, the, the other thing, too, is about this, that we're always accused of having an agenda. And folks, that's true. We do have an agenda. We care about our community, and we're going to fight for our community. Uh, four years ago, we had a show on, you know, on, you know um, uh, the crisis about, you know, immigration. And we were very tough on both political parties, the fact that they had allowed the wall to be built on the border. You know, and these are shows that we can do that large institutions cannot do. So it's very, very important for us to have an agenda. And when the large museums say they don't have an agenda, that isn't true. They do have an agenda. When these large art museums give over their prime space to European artists or white artists, that's not an agenda? Give me a break. It is an agenda. We're just honest about our agenda. But all museums have an agenda. And, and as I see the future institutions, there are three things we have to worry about. One is autonomy. More and more institutions that we have, of people of color, are not grassroots institutions. They are, they are institutions that are controlled by cities or counties or state. And you know, the autonomy isn't there to do a lot of things. And that's very scary, because you need that autonomy, because we have to face tough issues. The other thing is, of course, funding. That's never going to go away. We're always raising money. I throw people up. I drop on whatever falls on the floor is mine. We're always trying to raise money. That never ends. And the third thing is we are living in very scary times in this country. I am so scared of what's going on in this country. Uh, to, to have spent time, you know, out west in the south of Arizona and see how cuckoo those people are, how crazy those people are, it is unbelievable. I mean, I mean the fact that they have outlawed in all high schools, you know, okay, the teaching of my culture is absurd. You know, John Wayne was not the first cowboy, okay? It was, maybe, it was probably Juan Wayne, Jose Wayne, Felipe Wayne, but it wasn't John Wayne, okay? We were the first cowboys, and we did a lot of things in this country, so this, the fact that history is not being taught is really scary, so I do worry about the future of our institutions in terms of foundations may one day say, or funders may say, you know what, you know, okay, guys had your place, but now the big boys and girls can do what, what, you, know, you, know, what you were doing, which isn't accurate. What we do is very vital and very key. I'm very passionate about this, but thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. I'm gonna pose a few questions and then we will open um, the Q&A up to the audience. Um, these are four museums that I have admired for a long time. I believe that museums that sit in the heart of their communities and that listen to their constituents are what I call call and response museums. Yes, they do have the ability to do great research and great scholarship, but one of the things that distinguishes them is that they listen to their constituents, they know what their needs are, um, and having been on the board of a small community-based museum, your constituents hold you accountable. You know, they will walk in and if something is not right, they will tell you that it's not right and they will expect you to do something about it. Um, it's a kind of accountability that large museums don't have. Um, so the first question that I would raise for this group has to do with who your audience is. Um, we know that most of these institutions were created because you represent communities that were underrepresented and underserved in what are called mainstream museums. And so my question is, what's your goal for your 
um, immediate constituency, and what do you want the world to know when they come to your museums? And anyone can start. I'll jump right in. Okay. Um, we are in the Civil Rights District in Birmingham, Alabama. We are across the street from 16th Street Baptist Church, where four girls were killed approximately uh, five years ago, 2013 and across the street from Kelly Ingram Park, where many of the demonstrations took place. We're in a, the heart of downtown Birmingham. Uh, we will celebrate our 20th anniversary uh, this year. And that's on the heels of 20 years ago when no one wanted to support our institution. Uh, our audience has evolved to a very broad-based audience. We, we attract people not only from Birmingham and the state of Alabama, but literally from around the world. If you remember the slide that uh, you saw with the jail cell, and there was a lady looking into the jail cell, she was from Sydney, Australia. That gives you some idea about the audience that we have. What do we want people to learn about uh, Birmingham and the Civil Rights Movement? Very simply, that what happened in Birmingham, Alabama nearly 50 years ago continues to have a profound impact on race relations around the world as we speak. Uh, approximately six to eight months ago when we had the, what I will refer to as the unrest in Egypt, uh, we actually saw a youngster with a card that said, we shall overcome. I mean, where did, where did that come from? with the exception of Birmingham, Alabama. So that's basically the message. Uh, the city and what happened had an impact, a positive impact on race relations around the world even today. One of our challenges is that we have to, f we have to deal with so many the different kind of people come to the museum. Half our audience is, is from outside the community. And so uh, it's very important for us to make sure that they have a great experience. In fact, we see, we see ourselves as kind of like uh, cultural uh, ambassadors to the outside world from our tele community. I think that's very important for us. At the same time too, we also deal with many Mexicanos who are coming to a museum for the first time in their life. Mm -hmm. And you see them walk in sometimes and you can see they are like, okay, one step more forward. That's it. I mean, it's a new experience for them. And I know that sounds strange, but you know, and, you know, and I've been living in the United States for all my life. But when I go to a public building or any new building for the first time, I'm scared, believe it or not, because I expect something bad could happen. I know this sounds weird, but I think they feel the same way. So, they're, so, so even though we're Mexican, it says Mexican out there, there's still that thing about, do they want me in here? Is this place really for me? Because I think we've done, unfortunately, a very good job in this country of telling some people these places are not for them. And they feel it, and it's there. So whenever we see somebody, we just go to them quick and say, come on in, blah, 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 blah. It's free, walk around, blah, blah. And you know, it's very important for us to be good hosts because they're coming into mm -hmm. their house, in a sense. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure they feel as comfortable as possible. Thank you. Yeah. I think for the wing, uh, we have sort of a twofold. Uh, everything we do, we, we also have feel responsibility to uh, increase the a neighborhood economy, which is a challenge and which is why we're there. Mm -hmm. We stayed there and mm -hmm. so we do reach out to um, other people in the city who we try to uh, welcome people to our neighborhood. It's, there are some challenges, it's urban, and I think since we've expanded that, it's, it's been a big help. And if we can be successful at our museum, we are programmed so that the, all the other neighborhood businesses will see an increase in business. Um, I, I, I do wanna say something about the, um, some of the challenges that people have spoken to today that they're, they're actually challenges that are universal for the museum industry mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. talking about whether or not your um, exhibits are depressing and will people come because that's not what they go to museums for. I mean, to be, you know, really, um, ethnic history is not the only American history that's depressing. Uh, there are other topics too, and so <laughs> lots of museums are have to, I think it's more of an artistic question, but when it's look, looked at for us, it's looked at as an ethnic question. I mean, if there's a balance thing, and what is the story you want to tell? 
and how do you want to tell it? And so museums are, um, I think, do a lot with a penny. Um, I, I have business background and I have seen, there are so many museums in America and they have very little funds and they really produce. So um, I, I, I do see that a lot of the challenges we talked to today are, um, are important for uh, museums across the board, including the building of your audiences and what Conrad Eng talked about, the digital age and that people are no longer content with just spectating. They mm -hmm. are, you know, they are now feeling like they are creating culture, and, and that's something that is a challenge for all museums, and it's exciting. I, I think that our, um, our goal to increase our audience is, is in a couple of different directions. One is we, um, are, we estimate that about half of our visitors are not of Arab descent, and those usually come from two uh, sectors. One is the ch school children, because tours, educational tours from around Michigan is the largest source of our, our, our children's population who come. And the second one is um, hosting multicultural events at the museum, because we have a state-of-the-art theater and an auditorium, and we do art programs and, and things like that, that we attract a multicultural audience, but it's still from the southeast Detroit area. Our, our biggest challenge is taking a museum in Detroit outside of Michigan, um, which our traveling exhibits are, are going to be hopefully our best, um, our best route to do that because by taking our exhibits to universities, libraries, and other museums like this Patriots and Peacemakers exhibit, we're hoping to reach a much broader audience of people who would never set foot in Dearborn. Um, and then our last um, outreach effort is going to be appealing to uh, professional associations and other social and political organizations in our own ethnic community to have them think of the museum as a destination for their annual meetings and to do conferences there, et cetera. So. Great, thank you. Um, if people have questions, why don't you come to the microphones? Um. Yeah, why don't we start over here? Oh, she can't see me, hello. Mm -hmm. Yep. Introduce yourself, please, okay. and ask your question. Um, I was asked to, uh, from the man next to me oh. to ask the question since he's there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I just read the questions. Do you support the idea of deaf museums and deaf people are already seen as cultural and linguistic? I can't hear what you, what yeah. you just said. He's Sarah asking. Uh, she's yeah. asking if we support the idea of deaf Museum. museums or museums yeah. with deaf, deaf audiences. Yeah, de oh, like okay. deaf okay. museums yeah. and um, that deaf people are already seen as cultural and linguistic groups. And he also asks, why not do the deaf exhibition in each museum, um, like deaf Indian or deaf black museums? Is that right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Can somebody? And he's not somebody. like asking one specific person, so mm. whoever wants to answer, that's awesome. You can do that. Um, what I will say is that this is the, this, I think this year, if not next year, is the 20th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And all of our museums are supposed to be as completely right. as yeah. accessible mm -hmm. as possible. I do think that this is a nation with a short memory and that there, there was a time when people were very actively making sure um, that there were films with subtitles and that everything that we did was as accessible as possible. And I think that, that we kind of fall behind. Um, there was also a time when I heard about lawsuits a lot too, and I think mm -hmm. that that kept us <laughs> vigilant. Um, but I think that that is a reminder that we can do better across the board. Anybody else want to respond to that? I think you said it very well. Okay. Manjula? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Claudine. Manjula Kumar from the Smithsonian Center for Education and Museum Studies. Um, I'd like to thank the panel for sharing their um, ideas on very critically important issues to museums and especially um, specific uh, cultural museums. Uh, we heard about community responses, involvement, and we heard about attracting audiences. My question, and I think it's especially to Beth from the Arab American Museum, how honest, how truthful are these stories that you're telling, and how difficult has it been for, to engage the average public 
about getting to know the truth about the content and more contemporary burning issues that must be facing communities you know, in the Arab American world? Thank you for that question. Um, it, it, it's always difficult to assess whether your content is being presented in a, in a truthful way. We, we certainly um, try, to, uh, try to present our, our uh, permanent exhibits in a way that covers as many possible bases um, about the various immigrant experiences and what these people brought and what their concerns are. Um, in terms of the more contemporary um, controversial issues, uh, the museum doesn't shy away from those issues, but it is also very aware that it is a public, it is a forum for a very diverse community. Um, and it, for example, after 9-11, it, it just hosted a, um, a retrospective 10 years after 9-11 about the impact of 9-11 on various communities in the state of Michigan. It was done with the support of, of a Michigan foundation. Um, and so people from various cities in Michigan came to support this conference and present data as well as research and personal stories about how various communities in Michigan uh, responded to uh, the impact of 9-11. Um, and it was, it was done in a, in a thoughtful way, in a, as scholarly as possible, but also in a way that might um, not everybody agrees with some of the opinions, I'm sure, that were expressed in that conference. But it, it, was, a, it was an open forum. The, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a very good question, and it's very, it's very hard to know if the stories that we are telling will resonate with everybody that walks in the museum. Probably not. Like I explained, there are people, my own, some of my own grandparents um, would not count, consider themselves Arab, then they maybe wouldn't even come if they were alive today to that museum because no, 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 Arabs are those other people, not us. So it's so hard to say. I have embraced it. I have come as, a, as an activist and as someone who has studied this region, I've come to embrace that this, this general story resonates with me. It is, a, it is a large tenth story. It is a story that embraces as many possible narratives as, as we can accept. It tells the story about Muslims. It tells the story about Christians. It tells the story about people who have no religious affiliation. Um, minorities within the Arab world, uh, a lot of different aspects of these experiences, and it, it's, um, I, I don't know if we'll ever be sure if, if the story is true for everybody. You know, Mandela, when you ask about truth, my, in my head, the question I asked was, who's truth? Right. Um, at, <laughs> at some point in the history of our nation, there were stories told about my community that I absolutely disagreed with. Um, from the perspective of living in that community and in some instances even knowing the people who were being spoken about. Mm -hmm. So I do think that um, the, the, the image that comes to mind for me all the time as a person who went to art school, if you're in a figure drawing class as a person sitting in the middle of the room and everybody's sitting around that person in a circle drawing, but every drawing is different. Mm -hmm. And so every perspective is just a bit different and so your truth from the north and your truth from the south may not always be the same. Um, but I think that what you try to do is marshal the facts to the best of your ability. And then you can reflect how other people are affected by those facts. Eduardo? I'm Eduardo Diaz from the Latino Center here at the Smithsonian. And um, this question really is like, like either for or all, Helen, Beth, and Carlos primarily. Um, I think, Helen, during your comments, you were talking about the dis differentiation between Arabs and Arab Americans. And I think one of the, one of the things that we struggle with uh, at the Latino Center is, is this whole issue of country of origin and community of residence. Uh, because the, the Latino Center is about the US Latino experience, primarily not about Latin America or Mexico or, or Puerto Rico per se. Uh, it is about those the people who are from those countries who now live in this United States for however long, who were here before it became the United States, and the Salvadoran immigrant who got here two weeks ago to join family here in D.C., for example. So 
how, how do your museums uh, address that issue of the country of origin where, where it meets the community of residents? Well, ours is kind of easy because our focus is on one culture, <laughs> one culture of Mexico. But what we do is that we showcase the beauty and richness of the Mexican culture wherever it has manifested itself. And we show the artwork of Mexicanos on both sides of the border. And the way I like to explain it that if E.T. came back and got married to a girl who was Mexican, had children, the children grew up to be an artist, they're half Mexican, their artwork would be shown at the museum. <laughs> so we're very inclusive when we determine what we see as Mexican. But we see it both sides of the border, I'm not gonna, just one side. I'm gonna repeat the question because I don't think everyone heard it up here. And Eduardo, I think that you were asking about the fact that some of these museums deal with um, and your example was the Latino Center deals with, um, it, it is concerned with the Latino American experience and some of them deal with the experiences of people from their places of origin. And you wanted to know um, how these institutions, and I think maybe Wing Luke would be a good example, sure. deal with that. Yeah, how, how do you negotiate that, that, uh, that, uh, that space, you know, that, that space between, between being from, let's say, Korea, but perhaps growing up all your life in Koreatown, in Los Angeles, for example. I mean, how, 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 do, how do these culturally specific museums negotiate that relationship, the one between the country of origin and the community that they now call LA, Seattle, Dearborn, Chicago, whatever? You know, that, that's a good question. And I think the answer to that, it's been changing over the you know, over the period of time, and especially for Asians in this country, it used to be, because uh, globalization has changed a lot, and so before, it used to be that, for instance, if you were Vietnamese American, you didn't necessarily go back to the home country, or your kids that were born here didn't really have an opportunity to go back, and so now, going back and forth and political relations between the countries, all those things have changed. So I, I think from our point of view, we're a community-driven institution and we're very oral history-based, which is how we hope that people who are not Asian in background would find that they could relate to the story and, and, and find some relevance to themselves. Um, but because we're community-driven, sometimes it we, we allow our the committees to determine what, how relevant is it the experience or the history in Asia. We did an uh, exhibit on the refugee community and it was very important for people from that background. They felt that they're representing not just themselves and their family that came over, but they represent the people who didn't make it over. And so th those were much more global in, in nature. And I think for us, we take the cue from what it is, how people want their stories to be told. Yeah. I'd like to circle back to the uh, original question about deaf museums. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if the person who raised the question would let us know whether or not he feels that there should be deaf museums. That's a very good, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Hello? I think he's signing. Oh, he, okay. The, the question that I raised, yes, was do you think there should be um, deaf museums. Well, to be honest, I've never thought about this. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, he just, I'm sorry, I, I don't know this man, so he just like wrote this question on a paper and I read it. Um, but to be, th like, to think about it, I don't know, like, I can't, don't come from America, so I can't, let like, just, can just speak about my experience in another country. Um, in Germany, there, some blind museums where blind people mm -hmm. like you know guide other like visitors through the museum and like help to figure out um, the experience of being blind um, i don't know if something like this could exist for like a deaf person as well um, i'm curious right now so i i don't know um, <laughs> let's see what he wrote did you write something nothing Did 
I'm sorry, I just don't know right now what he said. It's fine? Okay, it seems like it's fine. I don't know. Okay, great. I just don't want to leave any loose ends because I think it's important to kind of think through all of the possibilities. And um, from my own perspective, I think I could learn something from a museum that was about deaf audiences and for deaf audiences, and so I'm open. Um, but if there's a particular advocacy point of view, I want to know about that as well. Are there any other questions? Claudine, I'd like to go back to the question about truth in uh -huh. museums. Uh -huh. um, when I arrived at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, one of the concerns that I heard from the community centered around stories that had not been told, mm -hmm. uh, gaps in the history that we portrayed at the Institute. And one of the things that we did to address those stories uh, was collect oral histories. And when we renovated the facility in 2009, we included those oral histories in the renovation of the Institute so that we did a better job of telling the, the, the entire story. And I, I think all of us that work at institutions who chron that chronicle recent history, this, this concern about why are you not telling my story? And uh, fortunately for us at the Institute, we had the benefit of Reverend Fred L. Shuttlesworth, who led the move when he was still around. And uh, to some extent, he could help us fashion uh, the story of the movement that we portray in the Institute. Great. Hi. Yes. Just going back to the um, idea of a deaf museum, I wonder about having interpreters in museums. Museums offer many different um, ways of looking at history and art a lot of it's reading, but there are also educational programs. There are also the audio tours. Um, but there could be interpreters in museums to open it up to all different people. Um, you could get into issues of American Sign Language versus all the other types of sign language, but that could be an option. That could be something that would be really interesting and very cool also from a hearing perspective to see interpreters in museums. You know, one of the things that we're, that's in development right now here at the Smithsonian is um, an app um, for an exhibition for blind people. Um, but what they're looking for are average people who've gone through an exhibition who, you know, talk about what they've seen, what they perceive, um, and how they've responded to the work. Um, what that has let us know is that a family could go through a a single exhibition and each family member could have a different app yeah. that begins to introduce them to a different aspect of the same exhibition so that they can hear it and experience it from their own point of view. Um, so the technology really will allow us to begin to help people to see, understand, and use our facilities in ways that they were never able to before. Yes. Yes, I'm Louise Scott from the National Museum of African Art and concerning the deaf person and a tour. I recently gave a tour to a group of people who are deaf and I think it's called the American Association of Translators came and signed my tour. So that's a possibility. Oh, that's an excellent idea. Mm -hmm. but, but I think that what our issue is, is that we're just not consistent. You know, if someone calls us and lets us know that the group is deaf, then we will have an interpreter. Um, but there's, n there's rarely somebody on staff who can be called if a family shows up and has that need. Um, so it's an issue that we're going to have to address with a lot more um, empathy and consistency. Thank you. If there are no more questions, um, I am going to conclude this panel. What I would say to you is I had the privilege of inviting these wonderful people to be on this panel because I had a, a fabulous experience at each of these museums. 
In the case of the Wing Luke Museum in the early 1990s, I went to an American Association of Museums meeting and it was one of their larger meetings. There were more than 3,000 people who came. And there were receptions at museums all over Seattle and I decided to go to the reception at the Wing Luke Museum. And that was before it moved into the larger facility. Um, two things that I really loved about that reception were the fact that local people told me about the exhibition. The entire exhibition was full of people who lived in the immediate community who owned that exhibition with a kind of personal passion that I had not seen in many places. The other thing is that they kept running out of food and people kept showing up with new pots of food. And the food just got better and better. And I love the fact that a community cared so much about its guest that there was like a pot of plenty happening at this museum. And it let me know that this was a place that a community loved, owned, and believed in. And they actually took part in understanding and really interpreting the stories of their own lives in this space. My experiences with the Arab American Museum um, really were about their um, event that's called Diwan, where they invite all types of artists to come in um, to share the kind of work that they do. And I went to their first Diwan, which was at their museum, um, and I actually have a real fondness for a spoken word artist and the spoken word artists who were there were of mixed ethnicity, but the two people who I really loved were a young couple um, who talked about being intermarried. And one person was Lebanese and the other person was Jewish, and they talked about the fact that they had grown up as children and what it was like to come from a war-torn country where it was difficult for their children to engage with both grandparents. And so for me, that museum experience let me know that these are museums where we hear the stories that we don't normally hear. And we hear them from the authentic speakers who are living this history. And if we don't engage with these places, we will never know how complex our nation is. Carlos's museum, you didn't see slides of it, but it is one of the most beautiful museums that you will ever visit. Um, and it is unique because they have a youth museum and they have a radio station. So very young people are about, are part of their community at a very young age. They make decisions about the content of what goes up on the wall in their youth museum and they plan the programming. And these are young people who are part of a pipeline. Lawrence talked about succession planning. The young people who are a part of his museum will be the kinds of young people who will keep the legacy alive and who will continue to run this museum when the civil rights generation turns it over to the social justice generation. And for the Birmingham Civil Rights Museum, which I think is one of the most important museums in our country, they have already begun to bridge that gap. They are a museum that started off telling a local story they understood its importance and significance as a national story, and they are now a part of an international community that works towards reconciliation and world peace. The story they tell, they tell collectively. Those oral histories are some of the most important oral histories that I have ever heard. And the interpretation of that story in that place lets you know that there is something about being a place-based museum. That museum tells important stories, but the city tells a story as well. And they let you know that Birmingham is a place with a legacy, but the presence of that museum creates a new future for Birmingham. So I would say to all of you, we sit here in witness of people who are doing incredibly powerful work. Their work starts out in places that are small, that grow, but it is the work that will inform everything we do in this field in the future. So I'd like to thank you all and turn the program back over to Ray. Thank you.